Thanks, Todd. So, so go ahead and get started whenever you are ready. Okay. Uh, well, th uh, thank you for for being here. I'm very excited to to be back in in the in the reading group, and I'm very like happy to be like also listening to your project. So I thank all of you that are here. Uh, today I'll, I'll present some progress on on the work that I've been doing with with Michal, Jason, Norman, and and Alberto. And the title is Understanding Geographic Disparities in Mortality. Hopefully at the end of the presentation, we'll understand more about uh, geographic disparities. And just the, the discl disclosure, this disclosure from the Census Bureau, like any opinions and conclusions expressed herein are those of the authors and do not necessarily affect the views of the US Census Bureau. And all the results have been reviewed to ensure that nothing confidential is disclosed. Okay, so, uh, well, you've heard most likely all the projects that, that Jason and Michal have about understanding health and, and mortality. And this is a continuation of this series of projects. So I'll be just very brief in the motivation. So I'm just presenting here the, a map that was created by Cherry and co-authors of the Opportunity Insights team, where they plot the, the life expectancy in different counties in the US. So here you can see that the differences are stark. Uh, in the south, south region, you can see that life expectancies are maybe below 77 for so, some counties. And in other counties, like in Wisconsin, the life expectancies are above 81. So what, what we don't think a lot about when we see these maps is how they are constructed. So this project will be about that. So just as a very brief motivation, there's a growing evidence that uh, early life shocks affect uh, uh, outcomes later in life. And these outcomes are health outcomes and also migration outcomes. So yeah, this first strand of the literature has shown that uh, things that happen early in life. Oh, actually, sorry, I think I opened the, yeah, this is not the latest, sorry, sorry. This is not the latest version. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I made some changes here and I noticed, yeah, so the first strand of the literature has shown that things that happen early in life at the individual level also affect uh, health outcomes at very late ages. And this second strand of the literature in the second bullet also has shown that these things that happen in early life can be clustered uh, geographically. So this particular literature has also used like natural disasters to show how individuals react to this. Uh, however, like, the life expectancy tables that are constructed usually in the literature, like the ones that I showed you with, with Chetty in the last slide, they all uh, group individuals based on the place of residence later in life, or if they use uh, the death certificates, they cluster people by the place of residence at the time of death. So this project and others of, of, of Jason and Michal are trying to understand if we are missing something when we analyze mortality data by aggregating outcomes based on place of residence instead of maybe something else that would be maybe more natural, like aggregating outcomes based on the place of birth uh, where individuals started. Okay, so the, the structure of, of the presentation uh, will be like four parts. In the first one, I'll, I'll show you how I constructed the life expectancies by state of birth using a, a, a relatively novel data set. Then I'll, I'll show you some descriptive evidence of life expectancies by state of residence and state of birth. And these two things I've shown previously, maybe like a, almost a year ago. So I'll just be very brief in, in this, but nothing major has changed in, in, in these two components. And uh, I aim to also present the third and fourth points, uh, decomposing life expectancies based on three different types of individuals, based on, on how they relate to a given state. So life expectancies of stayers, individuals that were born in that state and that, that they are also observed later in life in that state. Uh, immigrants, uh, individuals that were born out of that state, but they're observed later in a particular state and out migrants, that is the opposite type of individuals. And the fourth point that hopefully try to say more about which factors might be playing an important role in explaining these important discrepancies that we have found uh, descriptively. Uh, Okay, so the, the data, uh, this is uh, the mortality disparities in American communities, the MDAC. 
And uh, the good thing about the data is basically it, its size. So it, it, what it cons consists is the 2008 ACS sample linked to official death records in a given follow-up period. So uh, the follow-up period is all uh, death records that happen that are registered between 2008 and 2015. So we're following individuals that were alive in 2008 in the ACS and this observing whether they are still alive by the end of 2015. So the follow-up period is between seven and eight years, depending on when the ACS is, was collected. And uh, overall, it's a very big sample. So we have 4.5 million individuals. We're gonna focus on individuals born in the US. And also to say more about the mortality patterns, we're gonna focus on uh, individuals that are 50 and above, like younger individuals, they are very less likely to, to have died in the follow-up period. And overall, we were talking about a sample of about 1.5 million uh, observations. Uh, we observe uh, 308,000 uh, deaths, and most of the deaths belong to the age groups of 65 and plus, as might be expected. Overall, in our sample, we have 260,000 deaths, and yeah, about like 14% of the individuals died in the following eight years after the 2008 ACS. And we're using the location of individuals based on their stated uh, response in the ACS survey. So this is an advantage over maybe using uh, the National Vital, Vital Statistics System, like uh, the state of birth is reported by the same individual and also where they were located in 2008. Uh, the, the sample, I think I've said all of this here, but our strategy is uh, straightforward. We're going to group individuals in two different ways and then contrast what we get from each of the aggregation methods. We're first going to group individuals by their state of residence, and then we're going to group their individuals by, by their uh, stated state of birth, by the state of birth where they were born, the state where they were born. Uh, additionally, we stratify the sample by gender and five-year age group to be able to disclose these match rates uh, between the eight to, uh, 2008 and the National Death Index. So I don't know if this has been a little bit clear enough, but in the end, what we're going to have from this sample is uh, match rates, like what percentage of people survived this eight-year follow-up period uh, by gender, age group, five-year age group uh, state, and separating between the aggregation method by state of residence and the aggregation method by state of birth. And with these disclosed uh, survival probabilities, we're going to estimate the mortality curves by age and then calculate the peer life expectancies using standard demographic methods. Um, I think here, we, we, well, we have validated a little bit the, the data of the MDAC since it's a new data set. Uh, this is a little bit misleading. So we're still trying to exactly match, find a, a very good match with the state of residents with this data set and with the uh, equivalent measures that we would get with the vital statistics and population estimates that are the have usually people uh, create these life esti life expectancy estimates so the correlations across states and gender are quite good but overall the levels are a little bit uh, slightly off and yeah i think that it doesn't affect our results but yeah, overall, the correlation between the what we would expect to get from the vital statistics system and with this MDAC data are pretty similar. Okay, so the methods. Yeah, I've, I've tried to explain this uh, in the past, but I, I, I was not very clear and I've improved a little bit on the on the estimation method that we use. Uh, so if you have any questions, please, please uh, let me know and I can try to be more clear. So we use a two-step procedure to calculate the life expectancy for a given state and gender. So we calculate life expectancy separately by, by state and gender and by aggregation method. Uh, first, we, need, we have a problem of trying to fit what we see from the data, like the cumulative survival probabilities, and try to infer from that the mortality patterns with respect to age in this particular state and, and, and gender. Okay, so we propose this uh, method to overcome like this data uh, constraint. And with this method, we estimate the age-specific mortality rates 
that are the, the key ingredients that we need to, to use the standard life table methodologies to construct life expectancy uh, tables. Okay, so this first step is a little bit uh, non-standard and the second one is just following what the literature has, has done uh, with maybe more precise data uh, by age. Okay, so as an example, I'm showing you here the state of Florida and, and men and our aggregation method is a state of residence. And we, we have this data disclosed uh, by the census. So this is the probability of th this age group of 50 to 54 year old uh, that were, well, they were 50 to 54 in 2008. It was very likely that they survived this 80 year period. It was 0.95 or something like that. And we see these uh, survival probabilities for the eight different age groups that we have. Like our oldest age group uh, belongs to the 85 plus. Okay, so what we try to do is, is fit this curve, this aggregate uh, survival curve. And well, as you can see, this relationship is, is not linear. And we try to put a little bit more theory on how we can fit this, this curve. So what we underlying our model is uh, the Gompertz model, where we that has been basically just proven over and over again that uh, it really fits the mortality patterns in the data. So uh, the mortality rate in HA grows exponentially with age. Uh, we don't observe this. We observe actually the this M big M, the probability of you surviving this maybe seven year period, and what this, how we construct this, this data, like with the formulas, is just the probability of you not dying uh, every year of the follow-up period. Um, so we just plug in this uh, equation that, that comes from the Gompers model into the first equation and try to fit the Y, that is our survival uh, probability, and X is the particular age group. Okay, so we have like eight data points for each cell that is like state and gender and method of aggregation. And it's weighted because actually in these data points, this is a summary of a lot of individuals that are surviving there. So we weigh uh, each data point by the number of individuals that belong to each cell. Okay, so uh, overall, this is the, the methodology that we, we use to, to just fit the, the mortality patterns in the, in the data. So after this, this is just the first step that was a little bit un unusual. We obtain our slope and intercept parameters for each state and gender. And then plugging the beta zero hat and beta one hat, we get the, our estimates of mortality by age. And afterwards, this is the key input for the life tables. So we just plug in the, the mortality rates in the life table, well, using the life table methodology and we obtain the life expectancies for each state and gender and aggregation method. An important thing about all of these things is that we also try to, to say how uncertain we are about the, our measures of life expectancy that, yeah, it's not that usual in the, in the literature, but I think it's important just to be clear that we are actually finding a significant differences. So just to, uh, very confidently uh, conclude that the, the differences matter and exist across the aggregation methods. And in particular, we use two different methods. So one that is a classic one based on, on Cheng that is based on, on, the, on the life tables and you weigh each mortality by the, pro, by the people that were dying in each age group. And the second one that is a bootstrap. So we actually get like 1000 draws from this beta zero hat and beta one hat different draws. And then for each draw, we calculate a life table. We get a, from these life tables, we get 1000 estimates of life expectancies. And with these 1000 estimates, we rank them. And then we get the, the confidence intervals as what happens with bootstrap. And overall, yeah, I've worked on this. Yeah, there were some issues last time I presented, but now overall the, the standard errors across the two methods are practically the same. And for the states that, that where we find uh, significant differences, they are exactly the same. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions about the method. So these methods, this method I will also use it by when we separate by state of by stayers, uh, movers, immigrants, and also out migrants. 
Okay, so uh, these results I've shown you before and um, nothing really has changed. So just very small fluctuations in the estimates, but this is the results for, for males and the life expectancy is at age 50. And this is uh, in the X axis, we're plotting the life expectancies by state of birth and in the Y axis by state of residence. And overall, you can see, well, this gray line is the 45 degree line. And states that are to the right, you can interpret as states where the life expectancy by state of birth is higher than the life expectancy by state of residence. So for example, Ohio has a life expectancy of 30.6 by state of birth, but by state of residence, it's significantly lower than 25.9, 20, around 29.5. And in contrast, states that are to the left, for example, Florida has a life expectancy by state of residence that is around 30.5, but the life expectancy by state of birth is 29.6, something like that. Uh, and yeah, so the, the states that we are highlighting in black are states where we find significant differences. Okay, so this was our, the first goal of the paper, just to see whether there were important differences in certain states, and we find that. Uh, hey, hey, Hans, just something to... Hi, Hey, um, sorry, I'm I'm not turning my video on because I'm getting lots of internet unstable <laughs> signs. No, so no, no. I'm hoping this means you can hear me better. Um, but just a quick thought um, that it might be interesting to uh, keep note of these two states on on either two sides of this diagonal and think about whether my my hunch, but it could it could be wrong, is that the states who are below the diagonal may have larger outflow of migrants than inflows and the other way around for states above the line, right? So Florida is clearly a state where lots of people immigrate to in later life. So that's probably pushing um, the life expectancy up that way. Um, and then I'm looking at states like, oh, it, it looks like there's a lot of Midwestern states represented below the line, which suggests maybe people who are sending uh, populations, right, particularly selected on education away um, from yeah. the states. And that could just be interesting to to note as as one one first finding here. Yeah, yeah. At, in the last part, I'm going to try to say something more about uh, migration rates and, and the relationship between these states that are in the right side of the graph and the, the left. But yeah, overall, yeah, these states, the, the state of South, Carol uh, South Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Maryland, they do tend to have like a higher outmigration rates compared to, to the ones here in the, the Midwestern states. But uh, in outmigration flows, there's not, not a, a, I, I didn't find any differences overall. Uh, but yeah, this, this will be like a question for, I will, re, I will come back to it in the last section of the, of the presentation. Yeah, trying to see what's the role of outmigration and in-migration flows. Yeah, uh, sounds here. good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, just also to, sh to highlight like the uncertainty in the life expectancy things, uh, just highlighting that it's also important to see, to, to calculate this. Uh, and yeah, going back to, to what uh, Michal highlight, highlighted, and it's also a preview of, of the results that, that we have found like systematically over time is that the states that are to the right here, I'm just ordering the states by the difference of life expectancy by state of residence minus life expectancy by state of birth. So these are the states that are to the right. They tend to be the they tend to be concentrated in the south, uh, in particular in the south and south Atlantic uh, division and east south central division. And states that are here to the to the left are the ones that are in the were on the left side, and they are uh, basically in the Midwest and also in the. Um, in the Middle Atlantic uh, census division. Uh, so yeah, this was a, a first finding that they, these differences matter and they are also systematically linked to, to some geographic regions in, in the US. Um, and yeah, you can see here that we have states. Yeah, uh, we're finding differences in states that are, are big and small. It's not systematically linked also to the size of the of our confidence interval here also. Uh, so uh, geographically, how this how this looks, it's a little bit diffi difficult to just show uh, 
in, in grass, but uh, this just replicates other graphs like a cherry, but at the state level where we're plotting the male life expectancy at age 50. And again, we're finding that these uh, states in the deep south are the ones that have like lower life expectancies at age 50 and the, the differences can be in some cases uh, dramatic, although not as dramatic as if we had like county level data. Uh, however, if we measure life expectancy at age 50 by state of birth, we are actually finding that the differences are more drastic based on this aggregation method than by the aggregation by state of residence, which uh, it was a, an open question. It, it's not a, an empirical question. We were not sure what we were going to find. Uh, so just to be more clear on, on our results here, we're plotting the differences in male life expectancy. Here's just state of residence again, minus state of birth. And again, finding that the states were life expectancy by state of residence is higher. They are clustered in different regions in the US. And it, it's the opposite pattern in, in the states where the life expectancy by state of birth is higher than by state of residence. And just to highlight like the significance of our results, uh, we have a higher confidence that states here in the Ross Belt have a life expectancies by state of birth that are significantly higher by state of residence. And here in the South, and also uh, deep southern Virginia um, in Maryland, uh, life expectancy by state of residence is significantly higher by state of birth. Okay, so yeah, this is the first interesting finding that the differences are systematically linked to uh, regions. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the headlines of the slides now. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, so the, the results also matter for for the ranks of states. So actually when, when we see these graphs and we see the colors assigned to each state or each county, in this case by a paper of Murray and the eight, eight Americas, eh, what matters is the rank of the counties. So we also measure how the ranks change. If we measure life expectancy by state of residence and subtract that rank from the rank that they would obtain by the rank by state of birth, and again, we find here that the states in the South and also Colorado, well, Virginia, South Carolina, Florida, the, the ones that we have highlighted in, in the last sections, they appear to be in a higher position if the rank is made by in aggregations by state of residence compared to by state of birth. And it's the opposite result for uh, states that are in the, in, in the middle Atlantic or, or also in the Midwest region like Ohio and, and New York. So they appear to be in a lower position if you measure life expectancy by state of residence compared to by state of birth. And, and yeah, also the overall takeaway is that uh, rankings can be, they are also subject to a lot of, of measurement error. And they're a, but overall we find that 12 states have changes in ranks that are above uh, 10, 10 positions. Uh, so it's, a, it's substantial. So, Maybe you cannot see it here comparing these two graphs, but a lot of the states are changing colors between this map and this map. Uh, okay, so now we also stratify, we also show results for females, but we find that the relationship between the two measures is, is a little bit tighter for, for women than, than for men. So here overall, well, without considering these two outliers that really do an effect on the R squared, um, the, the correlation is like 0.8, and for many it was around 0.7, if I'm correct. But still, we find that the same set of states have significant life expectancies by state of residence than by state of birth. They are also similarly located geographically. And yeah, although you can see that less states are highlighted, like we have, we're not that confident that they are significantly different. So the, the results for, for women are a little bit more uh, nuanced. Um, so th th these are just the equivalent results for, for, for women. And again, we see that there are some geographical patterns here, but, but it's not that clear for women. Um, and yeah, and the ranks also change a lot for, I think like for 10 states that change in, in rank positions is uh, above 10. Uh, okay, so this is the first part of the presentation. So I, I think I went a little bit 
past year. Uh, hopefully you have seen this before, but our this descriptive findings uh, can be summarized maybe in three points. So uh, first is the, the regional inequality in mortality outcomes it appears to be starker when, when life expectancy is constructed by aggregating individuals based on state of birth compared to aggregations to the usual aggregation by state of residence. Also the state rankings and like the construction of the maps by rank change substantially based on the aggregation method. And overall, we find that uh, the aggregation method matters in the findings. So this is all uh, highlights uh, maybe a conflict in the literature of how to actually interpret life expectancy measures by state of residence. Uh, because the location that you have a, a later in life is also dependent on the situations that you had like earlier in life. Uh, so yeah, what is the role of migration? Just the suggestive evidence from, from our regional analysis is that a migration appears to, to mitigate the baseline geographic inequality in mortality outcomes. And here I, I just found like, a, not just found, but only one paper that tries to do different simulations on the role of migration to, to explain a mortality outcomes. And they find also in their simulations a similar result where migration appears to a mitigate a geographic inequality in mortality outcomes. A, the additional takeaway is between the comparison across genders between men and women. So overall, the, the relationship between life expectancy by state of residence and life expectancy by state of birth a, is, is tighter for women than for men. A, if you don't like the R squared measure, maybe because of the presence of outliers, uh, this mean absolute deviation on how what is like the average distance across the the two measures is also higher for men than for women and and this finding is similar based on the weights that that you associate that you give to each state so I think this one is unweighted just giving the same weight to to the states and this one we mm -hmm. we give different weights based on our precision on life expectancies and overall uh, this result appears to not be driven by, by migration probabilities across genders. So here I'm just uh, calculating the, the proportion of movers that, well, we can calculate just using the ACS data, like the usual ACS data. And we find that uh, women tend to move almost very, sim uh, si very similar rates than men. So actually what might be different across genders is the relationship between migration and health. Uh, and yeah, this, this paper in uh, Holiday et al. that I'm highlighting here uh, uses PSI, PSID data just to, to show that there's a, a link between your current health status and future migration outcomes for men. So healthier men are more likely to migrate out of their state. Uh, while there's no relationship, they don't find any relationship between migration and health for women. And this might be also like the nature of moves, like maybe women are also like tied to, are tied movers, like they're tied to the circumstances of their, of, of their husbands. So actually, yeah, like the probability of migrating of, of, of a woman is, is maybe uh, associated to the health status of the men, of the man, of their, of their husband. Um, we, I've, I maybe I overspent time doing the uh, robustness checks on, on these descriptive findings, but overall we were doing like 204 different regressions. And for all of these 204 regressions, the, the fit uh, between the actual survival probabilities that we, we disclose from the census and what we estimate are, are, are super close and the R squared is 0 0.99 and this is like also just supporting evidence about the comforts model and how how we actually link it's closely tracks like age mortality rates by age. Uh, our estimates of life expectancy by state of residence that are, uh, are maybe more usual than the life expectancies by state of birth. They are uh, have a high correlation with the human mortality database estimates. And yeah, I play with different assumptions about mortality patterns at very old ages. So the, the literature has shown that what you assume about the very old ages uh, matters for the levels of life expectancy. 
But uh, what we find here is that they don't matter for the difference in the life expectancies, the life expectancy by state of residence minus the life expectancy by state of birth. So different assumptions, they give different levels in the life expectancies, but they cancel out when you obtain the difference. And also, yeah, they are not driven by any particular cohort. So we observe the same patterns for, well, only just more measurement error because we have less data, but for life expectancies at age 65. And yeah, so overall, we don't see that this might be driven by specific cohorts. Okay, I don't know if you have any questions about the, about what I presented. I don't know what's the time, how much time I have left. Uh, but yeah, this is the first part and hopefully it was easy to follow and it's just a, a review of what we have shown previously. Hi, Hans. Hi, uh, How are you doing? Um, I Just a, a simple uh, question about um, the choice of uh, 50 life expectancy at 50 years. Um, I just want to know, I mean, just briefly, uh, what informed that choice and how changing that particular age as a reference, that particular reference point might affect your results. Um, I haven't obviously thought much about it, but I just want to hear your thoughts on why you chose 50 and uh, if any, if changing that influences any of your results. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think that we are subject here also to, to data constraints. So we want to observe at least 20 deaths in our particular cell, like given by state and age group, to be able to disclose that, that rate. And people don't usually, it's not likely that they die at earlier ages. So that, that also informs our decision to, to start at age 50. And also based on the literature that the mortality rate, like the Gompers model actually starts to work maybe at around age 40 or around age 50. Uh, so yeah, like mortality actually has like a U curve. I, some, yeah, like research of Michal has focused on, on earlier ages and how th that changes over time. But yeah, like maybe after age 50, it actually fits uh, yeah, a mortality grows exponentially with respect to age. But yeah, these, they are like just two trade-offs, like the data, just being able to observe the deaths of particular age groups and cells, and also uh, trying to simplify how we, how we model the, the parameters. Uh, okay. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and just do, you, using a different cutoff, like at age 65, uh, we we see like different we see all, almost the same patterns uh, that we observe for age uh, age fifty. So uh, this one just uses the data for people that were sixty five or above in two thousand eight, and we also observe the same same patterns overall. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it was, I was just curious as to like how that influences your, like if it would have a big influence on your analysis, but anyway, thank you. And please continue. No, no. Yeah. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. If you consider, yeah. One thing that you have to just keep in mind is that yeah, here people are survivors. Yeah. It's conditioning on you surviving at age 50. Uh, hopefully not a lot of people have died by that age across different States. I think, the question mainly came up for me because the lowest life expectancy, like the worst seemed pretty high to me. Um, and then I was like, oh, that's because you're starting at age 50. It was, I think um, the life expectancy yeah. when you added the, was like 78, that was the lowest life expectancy for males. And I just thought, oh, what, I was trying to look up actual um, life expectancy values. And I thought maybe they might on average be 78, but not as a lower, um, not, not female, but male, but yeah. Anyway, that was just my recollection. Sure. And that's where the question in my mind came from. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah, keep in mind. Yeah, this is conditioning on you surviving by age, by age 50. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's why they, it's a little bit higher than usual life expectancies at birth. Um, okay, so these are the first two parts of the presentation. The, the second two are, I haven't rehearsed that much. So, so please tell me if it's not very clear, if I'm not being very clear, or and also please, uh, I, I have struggled a, a lot on trying to say more about what is driving these results. So if you have any questions or suggestions, please uh, help us out here. 
Okay, so the, the third part will be the decomposition, uh, just constructing life expectancies of, of stayers, immigrants, and out migrants. And the fourth section will be trying to explain whether migration, what, what thing of migration might be driving these results. Okay, so actually the, the life expectancies by state of birth and by state of residence. Yeah, sorry that you cannot read this, this right because of this box uh, of a given state S they involve the consideration of three different types of individuals related to S. So the first one is uh, what we classify as stayers. So it's individuals that were born in S and in our particular setup that they are also observed uh, that the residence is in S in 2008. So uh, this group, actually we are we're grouping together like people that never moved and uh, return migrants. Uh, the second group is in migrants, so individuals that were not born in S, but that are, are observed in S by 2008. And out migrants, individuals that were born in that state, but that are observed in a different state in, by the time that we observe them. Um, yeah, I wanted to just, I, I, I was not able to do a stop here, but uh, the, the life expectancy by state of residence uh, actually involves just the first two types of individuals. So they don't actually consider out migrants in their cal calculation. Uh, while the life expectancy by state of birth only considers uh, stayers and out migrants, uh, people that were born in that state. So uh, life expectancy by state of residence is giving some weight to the life expectancy of, of in migrants and some weight to the life expectancy of stayers. While the life expectancy by state of birth is giving some weight to life to the life expectancy of odd migrants and the life expectancy to stayers. Um, I've tried to come up with the exact equations of these formulas, but I have not been very lucky. But uh, overall, these results come from, from mortality rates by age. So if you just focus on the uh, age, mortality age in a particular age group, this will actually be exactly the same, where the, the weights assigned to each group will be the, the weight assigned to the life expectancy of in migrants will be the in migration rate of that particular group. And the weight assigned to the stairs will be the, the additive inverse of the, well, or one minus the, the in migration rate in that state. And just intuitively, if, if uh, for example, Florida has 90% Residents are 90% were born, were not born in that state. The weights assigned to the life expectancy of immigrants will be higher in Florida than in other states, maybe in the Midwest. And the opposite is true for uh, life expectancies by state of birth. Okay, so uh, our uh, outcome that we're trying to understand is the 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 left hand side, the difference in life expectancy by state of residence minus life expectancy by state of birth. And just uh, subtracting the, the second equation from the first, we see that uh, the difference is composed of two terms. And yeah, we, we're giving some, some names to these two terms. So the first one is the life expectancies of immigrants in a given state minus the life expectancies of the stayers in that state. And we're calling that the exposed relative health advantage of my immigrants relative to stayers. So just the key thing that we, we're we finding is that what matters is the life expectancy of the migrant, but compared to the, to the stayer, not the, just the raw life expectancy of the immigrant. And the second term is the, the other term, but comparing out migrants with stayers in that given state. And the weights assigned to each of the, of the two terms are closely linked to the in migration and out migration rates at the at the given state. Okay, so what we're gonna do in this part of the paper is uh, try to get the estimates for the life expectancy of immigrants, stayers, and non migrants for each state, and just try to see any important differences in these two terms across states. Okay, so the, the method section in this part is very similar to the methodology that we follow for life expectancy by state of residence and state of birth. Here, the disclosure rules that we're subject to have a little bit more, more bite. So at least we need to have 20 observations. And I think that 20 deaths in itself to be able to disclose mortality rates. 
And since we're just narrowing our groups to stayers, uh, there are some states, particularly the very small states where we're, the native population is quite small that we are not able to, to disclose rates for more than a four age groups. So in particular, the, well, you can see that they, they are the, the smallest states. So Alaska, DC, New Hampshire, and yeah, they are basically the same for men and for women. And yeah, overall, our life, our life expectancies and our significance levels, they were giving way to, to our confidence in the results and smaller populations, we had like confidence intervals that were wider. So actually none of these states except for uh, DC, that was the extreme uh, state in the left. I don't know if you remember, and New Hampshire that was in the right are dropped for, for men and same for women. Uh, so we dropped these states and we construct mortality rates and cell sizes uh, for immigrants and non-migrants uh, from the informations of, of stayers and residents and natives. Um, yeah, I didn't go into a lot of detail here, but uh, the methodology is basically the same. So we have the disclose rates just by the group of stayers in each state. We have the curve, like as I showed you for Florida, we have the same curve for stayers in Florida. And we first try to, to fit the, the survival probability curve that gives us some estimates of how mortality rates increase by age. And then we plug in our estimates of mortality by age on our uh, life expectancy tables to, to get this life expectancy of stayers. And, and here I'm showing you just the selected states, uh, 14 states where we found the significant differences in life expectancy by state of residence and life expectancy by state of birth. And uh, yeah, these are ordered by the magnitude. So I don't know if you remember the graphs that I showed you before the difference of South Carolina was the highest. This is in the right, right side and states where the life expectancy by state of birth was higher than life expectancy by state of residence are in the left side. And again, these are clustered in the Midwest and, and uh, I always forget the name, and Middle Atlantic uh, Division. And these ones are in the South region. And yeah, you can see why these were significant. So the differences here are close to one and 0.5 for these bigger states. Uh, and again, and the patterns for state of residence compared to state of birth as we expected are the opposite way in these uh, southern states. Okay, the, the key thing that we're adding here is the comparison of these states with respect to the life expectancies of stayers. So overall, uh, you can see that the life expectancies of, of stayers compared to the life of expectancies of stay of birth, uh, we see that the life expectancies of stayers are always below the life expectancies of by state of birth. Uh, across all states. It doesn't matter if the difference is, is positive or negative across these measures. Uh, stayers appear to be having mortality outcomes that are worse than total natives. So, um, I don't know if you have any questions here. So yeah, actually out migrants will, this is just evidence that out migrants, people that are also uh, included here in the life expectancies by state of birth have better outcomes than stayers across all of our states. Uh, I think this is uh, better uh, shown in the next graph. But yeah, what I just tried to also show you here this, is that across all the 43 states that we, that we can calculate like life expectancies of stayers, we also see that life expectancies of stayers is more tightly linked to life expectancies of state of birth than by state of residence. Again, showing a little bit more evidence that maybe life expectancy by state of residence is really, really hard to interpret, harder to interpret that life expectancies by state of birth. Um, okay, so uh, this is actually like the, the most helpful graph. So instead of computing the life expectancies of by state of birth, that is actually out migrants and stayers and of residents that is immigrants and, and, and stayers. We are actually showing you here the three groups. And this is, well, this was an expected result. So 
to be able to find differences in these two measures in life expectancy by state of birth and life expectancies by state of, of residence, uh, out migrants have to really be outperforming uh, immigrants in the left hand side. And the opposite is true in the right hand side. So uh, immigrants are outperforming uh, out migrants uh, in, the, in the right hand side. Uh, again, the, the key thing to also notice is that stayers, this is just showing you again the same result, but maybe in a more clear way. Stayers and out migrants, there's some evidence that of the positive, um, the healthy migrant hypothesis, the out migrant of a given state, they have better outcomes than stayers. So you can see here that the difference is positive across all states. Uh, so yeah, the first descriptive takeaway about this is that actually what maybe is varying more across these states is the role of immigrants. So immigrants in the left-hand side, they are uh, in some sense doing equally as well as, as stayers in these Midwestern states. Uh, however, they are uh, drastically different in the Southern states where uh, immigrants are outperforming both stayers and out migrants. Um, and yeah, I think maybe, yeah, maybe these correlations are not that helpful. Okay, so well, these were the selected states. What happens when we show the 43 states where we can compute life expectancies of stayers? So again, just following on the formula that I highlighted before, what matters to understand uh, differences in life expectancy by state of residence and life expectancies by state of birth are these two terms that we named like the exposed relative health advantage of immigrants and out migrants relative to stayers. And uh, what you can see here is that, well, we have two things that could be explaining which states have significant differences. Uh, from this graph, at least to me, I think it's more clear that the X axis is the one that is helping determine which states have significant differences in, in across life expectancy measures. So uh, the states here in green are the, again, the Southern states where the life expectancy by state of re residence is significantly higher than life expectancies by state of, of birth. And the red states are the ones where we found the opposite result. And we see here that actually the exposed relative health advantage of out migrants across these two set of states is positive in, in both except for Colorado, but it's overall similar uh, in the y-axis, but in the x-axis is actually where the differences really show up. So in particular, this set of states, these seven set of states are not actually also like Alabama here, uh, immigrants are really outperforming uh, stayers. And in this set of states, immigrants are doing as equally well, or in some cases worse than, than stayers. Uh, so um, yeah, this is just some evidence of which of the two terms that I showed you have more weight in explaining the, the patterns that we've seen and just maybe it has to do with immigration of who is migrating to which state more than which person is moving out of each of the states. Um, uh, yeah, again, also, what also matters is the, the cross-state variance in these outcomes. So uh, for men, actually the, the, the variance across states in the relative, the exposed advantage of out migrants relative to stayers is, is smaller than, than the, the cross-state the cross standard deviation in the outcomes of immigrants. And again, I highlight this set of Southern states that are here in the right tail that are really boosting up the life expectancies of state of residence compared to life expectancies of uh, by state of birth. Um, okay, so this was the, the third point. Uh, now, I, I will try to say something about uh, migration and just trying to say something about like the causal mechanisms. So here I, I'm trying to say, be clear about the ex post thing because we only observe the outcomes of people after they moved out and whether they died or not in the follow-up period. But we don't know exactly whether they were healthier or not than stayers or than or in their source state or destination at the time of the move. So 
this is where the different underlying mechanisms are actually very, I, I find very hard to try to disentangle. Uh, but overall, uh, what we see in the data might be driven by different things that vary across states. Maybe it is that some out migrants, yeah, the, the relative health selection of out migrants from some states is substantially different from the relative selection of our migrants from other states. So maybe this is a story of a, maybe the life expectancy by, by state of residence in, in the Midwestern states is significantly lower than the life expectancies of by state of birth because our migrants were really positively select, selected on, on their health outcomes. Uh, this is, and that doesn't happen in states in the South. So just saying that maybe there's some degree of selection of who migrates from across states is the first point. There might be something about just where people might, they end up migrating to, whether there's some sorting based on their health status or not. It could be also a, a differences in in-migration and out-migration rates as, as Michal pointed out and, and that also the decomposition shows. So these differences between stayers and, and immigrants and out-migrants, they are magnified by the by migration rates in their state. And the fourth could be also the causal place effects and the interaction across these three. So yeah, just trying to say a causal story about the, the empirical patterns is very complicated and I, have a, I haven't been able to, to, to actually disentangle the, the channels. Uh, with this data, I think it's very hard without a uh, data on health at the time of move. Uh, however, yeah, I've, here there's some, some empirical patterns that might suggest that some channels are more important than others. Okay, so for this, this thing, I, 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 we've been trying to run like regressions of, of migration rates on life expectancies, but those regressions are hard to interpret and you don't know which one is the dependent variable and which one is the uh, independent variable for most of the, of the cases. Uh, I don't know what do you think about this one. So the, the idea here is to use the life expectancies of stayers, uh, maybe as a helpful proxy variable of causal place effects. So try to rank the states uh, in terms of how stayers are doing, might be more informative uh, of the actual effects of each location on the health status of their of their residents. And well, this might hold, for example, if there's not a lot of different selection across states. So if overall the same proportion of our migrants is migrating from each state, or the difference between our migrants and, and stayers in each state is uh, roughly similar, then this measure of life expectancies of stayers would be close enough to the causal place effects of of states. And yeah, I'm just trying to build this assumption also on, on some literature that has shown evidence of, of whether migrants are positively selected ex ante at the time of the move compared to stayers. And yeah, there are like two papers. I don't know the, uh, the other uh, literature uh, uh, with this, but I'm just highlighting here the papers in economics where they find that a, a black migrants that moved out from the deep south, they were positively, positively selected on health outcomes at the time of the movie in the great migration. And also a, this also happens in a completely different setup in rural urban migration from the Northern Plains to like urban, urban center, centers in the Midwest and, and Northeast. So maybe this assumption that a, our migrants are equally positively selected everywhere might be might be plausible and and here what I, we're trying to do is try to say whether there are systematic inflows or outflows of of migrants based on the on this measure of you know, we're basing to rank states on the life expectancies of stayers so in particular we're trying to ask whether states with higher life expectancies of stayers might have received on average more in migrants so you would expect this to be truth if true if individuals maybe value the effects of locations on health. So maybe a lot of of migrants they want to to settle in, in healthier locations, 
you would expect these states with higher LES, LE state to have higher in migration flows. And the opposite case in the case of out, of out migration. So do states with lower life expectancies of stayers have higher out migration rates on average? Okay, so there's some evidence on, that builds on natural disasters here. So, but this is at a more local level. So um, just using, um, ah, I forgot this, the, the dust bowl and all, um, a Hurricane Katrina and other like very major natural disasters, they show that, these papers show that our migration has to be a key adjustment mechanism for to natural disasters. So just trying to ask whether maybe in a more general level, whether we observe higher out migration rates on these worst, these worst states in terms of this measure of life expectancies of stairs. And overall, the evidence that we find with, with this cross section is that that doesn't seem to be the case. So here I'm plotting first the relationship between the in-migration rate and the life expectancies of stayers. So just to not deal with the issues of who is surviving at different ages. So maybe you think that as the population grows older and out migrants are positively selected on health, they will, will have a higher weight on, on, on the population rates. I'm focusing on the in-migration rate of 50 to 64 year old men. So in particular, this measure, I'm just measuring like using the ACS data, how many, what proportion of all the individuals that are our residents are actually coming from other states. So that this is our measure of in-migration rate and just considering the 50 to 64 year old men in the y-axis as our dependent variable and our X variable, the life expectancies of stayers, which could be a proxy for causal effects, uh, place effects. And overall, we find that there's no positive relationship here that maybe you would expect if individuals are systematically looking to settle in locations that are healthier, that are healthier and have better outcomes in terms of, of the outcomes that they observe in stayers. And yeah, overall, this is, if anything, negative. So if anything, uh, places that are a little bit uh, unhealthier based on this measure of life expectancies of stayers have higher in migration rates that, than states here. And yeah, here I'm using different weights. So th this is the same pattern if we don't weigh states. Uh, and in this particular specification, life expectancies of stayers, there's some measurement error in here. So I'm weighing states by the by the inverse uh, variance of our estimates and also by the population. Yeah, I've used like three different weights and see the same patterns across states. So overall, we don't see any positive relationship. And for out migration rate, uh, again, the dependent variable is the state out migration rate. So what proportion of the, of the people that were born in the state is the denominator and the, Numerator is what proportion, what, how many people are observing a different state. Uh, you can see that the average is like 40. So 40% 40 of 50 to 64 year old men are observing a different state than their state of birth. Again, there's no systematic relationship between our migration rates and these life expectancies of stayers. Okay, so yeah, this is a little uh, puzzling result. So what can be, actually explaining the differences across uh, life expectancies by state of residence and by state of birth. So just to, to again, resume the results, uh, in-migration and out-migration rates do not appear to be systematically linked to life expectancies of stayers. This could be because uh, maybe individuals at this particular point in time before retirement, they give a less weight to social, they give more weight to social ties or maybe it's to how much they will, will earn in, in locations than to the actual effects of that location on their health. I, it might also be the case that we're measuring things at a very broad level. So maybe these things that we saw that the literature has shown that for natural disasters, they happen at maybe at a more localized level, maybe at neighborhood. So if you live in a very polluted uh, neighborhood, maybe you switch out and maybe that this margin happens at a maybe more local level. And that's why we are not 
observing any systematic patterns at the state level, or it could also be some measurement error and, and bias from our measure of life expectancy of stairs that actually includes people that never moved and people that uh, came back in uh, came back to their state and we are not able to identify between these two types of individuals. Um, however, there's no evidence of a systematic out migration or in migration. And what we have also done here is, well, we cannot uh, analyze the migration rates at a more localized level, but maybe we can do it at a more broader level. So uh, uh, maybe what happens is that just individuals are moving close to states close to their to their state of birth, and just a, a small proportion move out of the region. So we are using a different definition of in migration and out migration that only considers immigrants and out migrants if they moved out of their region of of residence, uh, region of of birth, and again, well, you can see here the the in migration and out migration rates are half of them, like just half of the moves are across regions, and again, we don't see any systematic relationship here. If anything, it's slightly negative. So, uh, individuals that, yeah, there seems to be a higher in migration rate from people outside of their of that region in states where the life expectancies of stairs is lower than in states where the life expectancies of stairs is, is higher. Um, okay, so okay, let's see how much time. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is just uh, maybe a little last attempt to maybe say something else of why migration might be mitigating uh, the inequality uh, at the baseline. And here, yeah, this graph will take a little bit of time to, to explain. But again, I'm in the x-axis. Here is the life expectancies of stairs in each state, people that never moved of that particular state. And in the y-axis, we're trying to say a, it's just a, a measure of where these immigrants are coming from. So a, to build these measures here, the average life expectancies of stairs across sources, what I'm doing just to point an example here of Texas. And here I'm getting a 30 in the y-axis. What, what the y-axis means is the uh, weighted average of the life expectancies of stairs in all other states different than Texas. But where we are weigh weighing um, all other states by the proportion of people that, uh, uh, that move from that state. Sorry, I yeah, this, I haven't rehearsed this part that much. But um, yeah, so in Texas, you can maybe think that a lot of migrant in migrants come from also southern regions, stuff like that. So maybe 20% come from New Carolina, 20% come from Ohio, 20% from come from Kentucky, mm -hmm. and maybe just 10% come from other regions. What the y-axis means is the weighted average of the life expectancies of the stayers of all other states, but giving us weights the proportion of people that come from that other states. Uh, so we take that as a measure of like the average life expectancies of stairs at that particular, the representative in migration source. Um, I don't know if this is clear enough. I, I can maybe uh, try again. Yeah, maybe I would have, I should have. Could, could you interpret the slope? Can you what are you trying to say with the slope? Yeah, so, well, the first thing is that a, a, the destination of wh where you settle is not a, independent of your source. Or, sorry, a, the people that you're receiving is not independent of your source. So Alabama here, that is the state where that has the lowest life expectancy of stayers. They tend to receive migrants from states where the life expectancies of stairs is also smaller compared to states like Utah. Uh, but uh, overall, the, the slope is positive. So yeah, the the immigrants that you receive are not independent of of your of of the origin or of of, of, the, of your particular state. But the this slope is uh, much slower than one. So uh, states here 
in the left side that are more like the southern mm -hmm. states, they tend to receive uh, migrants from states that are, this may be also mechanical, from states that have a higher life expectancies of stayers also. So yeah, this is just trying to say that uh, comparing immigrants, the, the immigrant that you might expect to receive compared to the stayers, uh, states in the left-hand side, they receive uh, immigrants that maybe are come from healthier locations that, than your actual location, and the right-hand side is the is the opposite, and it's a little bit mechanic, mechanical. So if you're in Utah and you're the best place, you will just receive immigrants that come from other from worse locations, worse, worse locations, and that's the, also the case in Alabama. But overall, I think that the slope tells us that this relationship is not strong enough. And this might uh, be the factor that is mitigating uh, the life expectancies uh, by state of birth. I don't know, this part is under construction. So we, uh, if you have like any other questions about this, we can spend more time on, on these particular things. Or if you have any other ideas on, on how to include like life expectancies of stairs and, and migration rates, uh, yeah, I think that right now is the, the, the time to, to say something because yeah, it's, it's super complicated, at least for me to say something about the stories behind our patterns. Yeah. So I have a quick thought here, Hans, which is that as someone who is trained in public health, I obviously think that health is really interesting and I think the health of immigrants is really interesting. I also think that immigrants rarely actually consider health in their migration decisions, right? So migration may have a big impact on health, but usually when people are making decisions, they're maybe considering other domains of well-being and especially kind of livelihood, right? And and where there is family probably before they think um, about health. So I, I would guess that, I mean, this seems to be a little bit consistent with your story that there is not necessarily, that like immigrants don't necessarily like think about life expectancy at their destination as, as a major factor, but it does happen that, you know, some places that are also major immigrant destinations also have higher life expectancy for a variety of related reasons, but not necessarily reasons that are driven by health. So I almost wonder if what you want is to look, you know, there, we're, we're interested in health selection here, but what is driving the decisions about destination is probably not health and it may be easier to look at other economic indicators, right? Like, you know, the like the the you know economic economic indicators of, of growth or size of the economy or availability um, of jobs that are likely to employ people that's probably more yeah. kind of determining whether people move somewhere um, rather than than the health consider it's it's sort of like a an an effect not not part of the causal story yeah 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 I totally agree. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't show it here, but yeah, that's why also I tried to just focus on the 50 to 64 year old people because I think that maybe at, at retirement, the weight that people give to different characteristics of locations change. And yeah, for the 65 to the 80 year old people, I, I do see maybe a more positive relationship between the the our migration rates and the health outcomes at the at the destination. Um, but yeah, 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 this, yeah, what you're mentioning, Michal, yeah, it's also supported, yeah, like maybe what determines what you, where, where you migrate, like in adulthood and, or maybe college decisions and also your employment prospects. Um, and a, another piece is in the in the epidemiological literature recently, I think when people are trying to figure out like how to model neighborhood effects and effects of place in general, the, the idea that I see coming up a lot recently is that sort of place is sticky um, in, in the sense that like there is these long term effects that it's hard to really just because you move someone out of the place doesn't mean that those place effects are completely gone. Um, and that seems to be related to some of the findings that you have about the comparison of migrants to the people, you know, to the people who stayed to where they're from relative to the people who are at the place where they're going to. Mm -hmm. 
it seems to be consistent with that idea that there is some kind of longer it, it's both that there is a long lasting effect but also it's it's differentially harder easier to leave some places relative to others right so you might imagine that if you are from like the suburbs of a big city it may be easier for you to leave that place for you know education or for employment than if you are you know from maybe a small a smaller rural place mm-hmm. right so people people's ability to leave a place also varies differentially by the place that they're from yeah yeah this yeah i'm right now i'm trying to base the assumption on that it doesn't vary by location but yeah if you add that extra complication yeah it's super hard to to say more causal a uh, causal story here Right. Um, yeah, so I, I think the the point of that is not that that like it's hard to tease all of these things out with the data that you have that's so limited. But I think these are all reasons why various estimates might be biased, being being biased towards the null, right? And in, in yeah. estimates is because of yes. all of these factors. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what else to say here. Yeah, I think just there's a little bit of disconnecting between the first part and the second part. So yeah, if also you have some comments of, of how to link these things to the, the first section or have also, I yeah. Was, Hans, I was trying to label these with like a short phrase and I was I was thinking that the first two, um, like the two null results, this is one of them, is I'm wondering if you could label them as like pull factors and push factors like is an unhealthy place of birth pushing me out? And I think you're should like out anywhere. We don't know where, but just out. And then the other one is, are people drawn to, am I being pulled to healthy places? Um, is the in migration one? I don't know if that's actually right. So I'm asking to see if you think this is uh, a couple key words that would be what you're trying to do here. I, I put those mostly in contrast to the next one, which I don't know what the key words are in some sense. Like I don't know how to label the one with the averages. So it's like a two-part question. Do you agree with the push and pull terminology or is that too basic? And then well, is there a similar no, terminology to the third one? No, I think I, I totally agree with the, the terminology. Yeah. Just the, th- right th- the third one, there's not really a easy way of terming it. Is that the, so the one on directionality of out yeah the one that you have in front of you is there a an easy way of terming what this is supposed to you know try to be a list like like the first two are null but like you're both saying like it's a there's enough problems with the descriptive exercise that we wouldn't say like it's not happening at all but like in general that's not the main explanation maybe you could say that it's not push and pull but this one I don't I was struggling with how to briefly say what it's supposed to be showing. Yeah, yeah, what I'm I'm trying to show here only is that maybe, yeah, if, if you have like in the left, in, a, in the imaginary left column, like states ranked by like the, this measure of life expectancies of stayers and then the destination, I think like where people are going and and coming from, it's it's maybe all over the place. Uh, yeah, like, well, it's not a completely independent, like if it was completely independent, if you're, you received immigrants from any state and it doesn't matter where you're located, it would be like a horizontal line overall. Uh, That's but yeah, what I'm struggling like, with. That it's not like a null result, then I don't, but, but since it's not a null result, I don't know how to phrase what the, what the result is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm still also like trying to, f- to figure that out. I don't know if it's, yeah, I think I need to think more when, you know, about these, these things. I don't know if they are even. I mean, is it something like that, that this is saying that you're somewhat more likely when you leave, that you're somewhere, somewhat more likely to just go to a place that's kind of similar to where you started? Is that, <laughs> yeah, is that just, close yeah, or just, not? Which is to say, like, I mean, you, you might want to, Part of that would just be the spatial, the maps that we saw in the beginning. Like if, yeah. if moves aren't all across country, then like this has to be part of the story that like, yeah, exactly. if, if it were true that people who leave one state in the South go to a different state in the South, and that has to be partly baked in to this like similarity thing. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, what I, I was maybe trying to accomplish here, just this, yeah, as you, yeah, the, the people that move out, and it's also maybe just by mechanical, like the people that move out from, from Alabama, they on their representative destination has a, the, the stayers there have a higher life expectancy than. than well, I get the bookends problem. Like if you're going from the worst or the best, then the there's the mechanical thing, but like along the rest of the range, you kind of don't have the extreme mechanical problem that you actually could still go to a place that's better than yours or worse yeah. than yours as you move towards the center of the picture. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe what I'm describing is uh, a second test, which is to somehow, is to in some sense, deco decompose this effect to um, based on distance versus based on the health of the receiving place. It's something like that. So like you wanna, you wanna know that this full result and then you wanna see, like there's a, one mechanical thing is just the first maps, which are that there's just this huge red light in Southeast. And yeah. so part of that is just that. So in some sense you wanna ask, what is the proportion that I'm finding here that's just physical distance or like geographic distance versus, and you could either do like actual distance to distance or maybe this would be like a, census region or census division analysis of like a within versus between, you know, if you leave your census division, are you more likely to go to a healthier place or a less healthy place, that kind of thing. So I don't know if this is, if this is, th th I haven't resolved in my mind whether that exercise gets you anywhere. Like I see the push and pull is like a couple results that are of interest here. I'm still, I guess I'd have to see it first to see whether it's moving the story ahead or if it's just going to be people go to places that are similar and we don't know whether it's because it's like close in distance or close in health. I don't know, Michal, I don't know if, if, if you can weigh in on all that scramble of questions. Oh, first I just wanna check, Eva, is your, is your comment related to? Uh, it is somewhat, but it's taking a few steps back. So why don't you finish your comment on that? Um, and then I was just going to come back uh, to, I can come back to my question. Okay. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I did this, these measures just by the, the definition of regional moves, not by the contiguity, but yeah, I found this is also like by construction. Um, well, this is not, hmm. okay. I didn't, didn't update the links here, but yeah, this may be also by construction, we find a negative result. So if you, I'm just considering- what's, what's region mean here? Is it, census, is it nine census divisions or is it- No, the, the four regions. So I, here I'm just considering like where the representative immigrant is coming from, but just considering immigrants that are come from a different census region. And yeah, here you can maybe also expect that there, it's a negative relationship. Like all these states in the South, they will, I'm just weighing all the other states in the different regions. Well, the, the states here, they give some weight to the states in the South. So yeah, I think that maybe that this, this distinguishing between the regions is not a fruitful avenue, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, I, or maybe I can just jump in. I, I was, when you, when you go towards that and look at that chart, it makes me think about um, kind of coming back to your question and what you're trying to answer because you're trying to get around some um, issues with your data perhaps. So if I can just sort of summarize what I'm getting um, from your presentation, you, you're going into this and your main motivation is, well, we've been summarizing data by state of birth uh, normally, but what if we do it by residence and are we gonna see a huge difference? And you're demonstrating, yes, there are differences and the, the second part is really where um, I'm wondering what your question is and what hypothesis you're testing because that might inform what analyses you're doing. Um, I mean, you obviously understand, okay, what are these differences being driven by? And you've given us some ideas like, well, it could be, you know, healthy, the healthy migrant um, uh, move and so forth. And so you have a lot of these things and here you're um, thinking about, well, maybe it's because certain states are more similar to each other. And so you're trying to sort of pick at all these different reasons that could be contributing to the differences between the 
rates the uh, expected um, life expectancy of, you know, calculated by state of birth versus state of residence. And so I'm just wondering if you can pick one hypothesis to just um, to simplify it almost for yourself, instead of trying to uh, look at all the potential reasons that it could be causing the differences, but look at um, first rule out a few, um, like, is there a way, I don't know what your data are like, but um, we know that, you know, people move because of jobs. So maybe by occupation, by big occupation groups, white collar, blue collar, something like that. Um, if you can maybe even, uh, there was somebody had brought up rural versus urban um, and then also education. And so if you can see among these groups, I don't know how big your data sets are, of course, um, just to get rid of some of those questions and to see if you observe the same patterns, at least in a descriptive way, that might be really informative. Um, at least that's what I would like to see is um, that might be helpful to just understanding it. Because uh, the way that I see the chart that you just presented is, you know, could, are we really seeing a pattern maybe about similarity of states and could that be causing the differences? Um, like, are, are we seeing Southern states move to Southern states, uh, people from Southern states move to Southern states and could that be causing some of these differences? But it's really not answering the question. Um, it's hard to answer the question using that. So I don't know which date, what data you have available. Um, sorry, that, that was just a general comment about just maybe a suggestion of a way forward, because it seems like you're putting in a lot of effort to summarize the data in different ways, but it might not be answering the questions and so the, uh, that you have. And so now my question is for you, like what, what is your you know, follow-up question or can you focus on one? Okay, yeah, thank you for the su suggestions. Yeah, I don't have like an answer right now, but I'm gonna think about them. Yeah, those are- so I'm, I may have- if I have a good, so thank you, Ava. That that was a really good question. I think I ha maybe have a follow up, Hans, that maybe will help a little. So I'm looking at your slide 36, um, that's comparing the the in migrants, the out migrants, and the stayers in in the two. Uh, sorry, maybe it's a different number on your. Uh, 35. No, it's the one that's life expectancy of stayers in migrants and out migrants. Yeah, uh, I think it's this one. Yes. Um, Sorry, just dif different than the ones that were that were sent out. But yeah, it's the the last one of of these um, before you get into the into the circles, um, right? So so what I am what I am taking from this right is that we are you have shown pretty convincingly that people who leave right that out migrants no matter where no matter where they're leaving they don't do worse right they they do about they either do about the same or better to different to different extents so clearly like people are leaving in search of opportunity right i'm i'm going to stick to my contention that people are usually not thinking a lot about health um, for for this cohort and when and when they were moving right they were probably not necessarily primarily motivated by health but they were seeking some kind of opportunity and both that and their own selection seem to have resulted in sort of better um, longevity outcomes so people who leave a place no matter where it is, right? Whether it's, you know, sort of in the Midwest or whether it's in the South, like the people, people who leave seem to be doing it out of the pursuit of like something good. Um, and often that seems to, to work out. Um, but, but we understand less about the factors that bring people in to given states, right? So we understand more about why people leave as individual de decisions, right? We understand less about what brings people. And intuitively, you might think, well, it's the same thing, right? The people who move or someplace or who leave someplace or the people who come somewhere else, it should be the same. But what this is showing us is that it's not, right? It's that it's not the same. And it's not the same because it depends on where people are going. And, you know, it looks like, you know, on the right hand side, you have a bunch of places, you know, with warm climates. And given, you know, the age that you're looking for, right, this may be drawing people who ha have already like been healthy enough, right, to survive to, to older ages. And then they're moving to places where the climate or amenities, right, Colorado, or, like skiing or whatever, right, like for, for a variety of reasons, they're like nice places for people to spend sort of time in life when they're already 
well established in their careers or at the end of them and those are just like good places to live they're good places to be 50 and over whether or not they are good places to have been born in but they are they've got something about them that pull people to them as sort of good amenities on the other side right on the left side of the screen you're seeing that people who move to these places are doing no better right than the like usually not much better um sometimes even worse than people who have been there all along and so that raises the question of well what <laughs> what brought these people to these places right like why didn't they go um somewhere else and i wonder if that's people who are more likely to be moving you know closer to family rather than for amenity reasons right or are they moving somewhere like they're also it's a combination of places like you know Oklahoma and Indiana that are not so expensive, but also places like Pennsylvania and New Jersey that may be expensive, but also have parts of the state that are not right. There's big cities there, but so it's it's complicated. It's hard to know. But but the the big difference between these two panels to me is in is in the difference between the red, right, the red bars um, and the green. Uh, with the blues kind of consistently being like, so so people leave for good reasons. Why do people come places? Well, it's different in different places. And it seems to be more about the characteristic of the receiving place, maybe, um, than about the characteristics of the migrants themselves. And so I think maybe the question that we want to ask now is like, what what is it about these places, right, that are pulling? Like, why, why do people, who are the people who immigrate to Oklahoma? right or who migrate to Oklahoma where do they come from and why like I would guess it's family and it's jobs right in certain sectors um, that are drawing people and that ends up being differentially selected than the factors that you know sort of pull people to come to a place like Colorado or South Carolina or Georgia in later life yeah yeah thank you for it yeah yeah I, I totally agree with with with, a, with your takeaway from from the graph, uh, and and yeah, I think you nicely e express yeah like what we what we can say from these graphs is that yeah the important factors here across these two set of states is the who is coming to the states and not who is who is moving out. Uh, uh, yeah, and thanks for all the yeah the 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 clarification about yeah like just expressing i just i just wonder how much of it is other factors like that are not in your data that are explaining these things right like what what people like what's what's pulling like it's it is questions about what's pulling people to particular places and that's different across across these places and some of it is is geographic proximity i would guess but but maybe right like it's 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 basically it is life course factors that deter like like the chances that i will ever move to oklahoma are i'm pretty confident very close to zero right <laughs> um but but i can imagine that if i was like in the oil industry like that could be right there there may be a way that i would end up moving there right rather than in academia and so like there, there are different things about oklahoma that make it more or less likely that different types of people will move there okay yeah, I was trying to think more about yeah, the, the sort of jobs that are in different places. And yeah, these are also like the Rust Belt, Rust Belt states, so it could also be driven by the occupations and right. Like yeah, we can and, say that none of these none of these are places that seem to be drawing people by their climate. Right? Like yeah. um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah, I didn't decide on Madison for its winter, its <laughs> lovely winters. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, th yeah. I don't know if I think Wei also has a. Yes, a sorry, Wei. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Hans. Hi, Wei. Uh, so, I, so I have a comment, very, very similar to what Michael and uh, Eva said. Uh, so people move for different reasons at different stages of their lives, right? So, right. I would expect that places with more economic opportunities would receive more immigrants of working ages, and then states with more age-friendly policies or infrastructures would receive more immigrants of retirement ages. So the, the implication of the di age differentials of immigrants is that the life expectancy in states that receive 
more working age migrants would be driven down a little bit because the micro immigrants are less selected. So, so even in the state, there are more mm -hmm. younger migrants coming in. The effect of these younger migrants might be driving down the life expectancy of the whole state compared to states where there's more older age immigrants because they are more they are more health they are healthier and they're more selected. So I'm wondering if it would be somewhat illuminating to look at the age distribution of migrants in and out migrants in different, in different states. And then maybe we can see which states have more migrants of working ages and which states have more older migrants. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for the, the uh, suggestion. We, yeah, I think, yeah, what we can uh, see, I didn't include it in the graph, but it's the 60, 65 plus thing. And, and yeah, I think you, uh, you're right. And it's also an important key of the, the paper maybe is that maybe these retirement destinations, they're just attracting more, as you said, positively selected people based on health. And that's what it's boosting their life expectancies by state of residence compared to state of birth. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I just, maybe the data sets are not ideal. Like even in the ACS, there's not a question about the time of the move, but maybe with a, uh, well, just with different cohorts, maybe with the just retrospective sense, well, different censuses, maybe we can say something about the, the time of the move. Uh, but yeah, oh, I think there's, there's no even mention on the timing on when they, they migrated. Okay. No, th there's a question uh, that I, well, I've used like just separately just to say whether a uh, return migration might be an important bias, but it's just whether you move to your current location in the last year. And maybe around one percent of the individuals have moved in the in the last year. Um, but but yeah, I think maybe just using like all like past censuses can say something about the time of the move. But but yeah, I think you're yeah like the intuitively I would expect also like the age and migration of of migrants in this particular set of states, like the hot weather, like retirement destinations might, might be higher and could also infer something about the positive health selection there compared to stayers. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, well, I think I'm gonna conclude now. So maybe I'll just skip this thing. It's still unclear whether the, the slope information is useful or not, but uh, overall, I want to just try to explain why maybe migration is mitigating the discrepancies in, well, mitigating like the baseline inequality in, in mortality outcomes and based with this gradient, but you know, the, st the story is still not, not clear. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, in this paper, we have first shown some significant differences between life expectancy by state of birth and state of, of residence uh, for a uh, a uh, high number of states. And these discrepancies are systematically linked to geographical regions in the US. Um, uh, what we have maybe shown more, con more convincingly is that immigration who immigrates to different states uh, varies across states. And this is a key driver of uh, our, our differences that we are, we are finding in the empirical patterns. And this also points to, to some cost, throw some caution about interpreting uh, life expectancies by state of residence at face value. So, yeah, just also adding upon what uh, Michal Jason and, and, and we have, have said it, like even just thinking about even changes in life expectancies by state of residence could be even more, more tricky. Like it could be just Florida has become a better place for like wealthy. Uh, retirees and this is what is posting the changes in life expectancies by state of residence. So the interpretation of the levels and also of changes is even more challenging. And, and yeah, well, still some work needs to be done to 
say a little bit more about the potential stories that are explaining the, the patterns. And, and well, thank you for your for your helping during the presentation. Yeah, it's 12, so six, sorry, I didn't know. Sorry, I thought it would end at 12.30, I'm so sorry. Hans, I just have one question to leave you with um, and just to think, and maybe you're already thinking about this. For me, the question is, when would people want to use life expectancy um, uh, of by state of birth versus when would they want to use life expectancy by state of residence? Um, just to think about fine, like when we summarize information, yes, there are differences, but when is one more advantageous versus another? Okay, yeah, thank you. For, yeah, still not, not clear to me, like the answer to that question, but yeah. Um, yeah, we also have like the life expectancies of stayers, whether that's more informative, it's also like a, a, a still open question. But yeah, thank you, Eva. Uh, well, thanks. I hope to see you soon in person. Hopefully Take very care. soon. Bye. Thanks, thanks Hans. Much, this is really interesting. Yeah, thank you.